Welcome to the Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Welcome to the Table. We discuss issues of God and culture. I'm Daryl Bach, Executive Director for Cultural Engagement at the Hendricks Center at Dallas Theological Seminary. And our topic today is biblical masculinity. We're going to try and discuss uh, how Scripture uh, portrays the role of men in Scripture and, as a result, of course, the relationship between uh, men and women in the design of God. And I have two uh, wonderful guests. Uh, I have Carolyn Custis James, who is an adjunct faculty member at Missio Seminary, or formerly Biblical Theological Seminary, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And she also serves as a consulting editor for Zondervan's exegetical commentary series on the New Testament. And then uh, with her, and they're both on Skype, so this is kind of a new um, new gig for us. We normally have someone in the studio. Um, Andreas Kostenberger is research professor of New Testament and biblical theology, as well as director of the Center for Biblical Studies at Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. He's the only person I know whose title is almost as long as mine. So. Uh, <laughs> Um, so it's uh, greetings to y'all uh, from Dallas. Uh, Andreas is in Kansas City, and Carolyn is in Philadelphia, or at least a suburb of Philadelphia. So thank you for being a part of the table. Hey, great to be part of a conversation, Daryl. Great to see you again. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, glad to do it. Let's let's dive in. And um, I'm from the South, so ladies go first. Uh, Carolyn, um, talk about how you got interested in this topic and uh, and some of the work that you've done uh, in relationship to it. Well, I my work was all about women to begin with, and it began in a very personal way because. I grew up with very clear ideas of what my calling was as a as a woman, as a Christian woman. And um, I found through my circumstances that I couldn't I couldn't get it onto the map. Um, I was single for ten years after college. so I didn't get married and start a family. and um, when I did get married, my husband was in his uh, seminary training, which turned out to be finishing a master's degree and then two doctorates. So I was the breadwinner and at the same time um, fought the battle with infertility and lost. Hmm. So I couldn't be what I thought I was called to be as a woman. And I began to struggle with the fact that the, that the message for women that was coming out of the church was talking about a season of our lives, and it was excluding a lot of women. When I um, read the Genesis creation narrative, and it was about in Genesis 2 about the creation of marriage, I was on the outside looking in. And so I started, I went back to scripture with bigger questions, looking for a message for women that would begin when we begin, and that would last until our final breath, and that wouldn't leave anyone out, and that was global, not just in the Western prosperous America. Mm -hmm. So my questions were bigger. They were very personal. I felt like a lot was at stake. And um, so so as I studied, I focused a lot on Genesis 1 and 2 because that's only pre-fall information that we have. Um, but I looked at the narratives of women in the Bible and began to see how God was calling his daughters out in all different kinds of ways. And um, I came up with a message for women that is just changing lives. I mean, I've met with middle school girls who are just on fire and elderly women who say, you know, 96 year old saying, I'm asking what God wants me to do with the rest of my life. Hmm. So it has been very empowering and it has also been very um, 
good for relationships with men. It hasn't been women at the in some kind of competition with men or in some kind of battle with them. Um, it's not a zero sum game. It's about the flourishing of women and the flourishing of men as women flourish. So, um, but as I studied the stories of women, I started coming across a lot of stories of men in the Bible that we just sort of push to the side. They get eclipsed by somebody bigger in the story, like, you know, in the New Testament, Joseph sort of gets eclipsed by Mary and Jesus, which, you know, there's no shame in that, but there's a there's a powerful story in Joseph. And, you know, he's the lead story in Matthew's gospel. Um, and I wanted to I wanted to tell those stories, which is what got me interested in it. But as I started investigating, it just got bigger and bigger in the questions um, that were surfacing in the 21st century. Um, we needed to engage for men. And I found that men were, a lot of men were as lost as I was and a lot of other women. Um, so, you know, that's how I got interested. I think that I would say the women led me to the men. And, um, you know, we sort of focus on, um, you know, the more powerful stories of men in the Bible, the leading figures, um, David and Goliath we love, and Joshua and Jericho and Daniel and the lions and these very manly stories. And there are other stories in the Bible of men that are just jaw-dropping in the kind of a different kind of man that God creates when he really works in the soul of a man. Um, so that's what I did. And as I, as I studied it, you know, I just, I, I zeroed in on patriarchy and I can talk about that later and how important um, that became. So, but anyway, I think women led me to the men and I could see that the same kinds of struggles that women were going through, um, there was a, a parallel kind of struggle that men were going through, you know, that it's the gamut, you know, that, I mean, one of the things that we ta I talked about with women was that, um, the, the trafficking of women and, you know, do you, do, are you completely demolished as a human being or is your identity, meaning and purpose intact because of what God has done? Um, and I found that 30% of humans that are trafficked are men and boys, mm. which, um, you know, they're trafficked for sex or for forced labor or to be soldiers. And I asked a friend who works for the U.S. Census Bureau to give me a sense of what that was. And she said she came back to me and said it's roughly the population of New York City proper. Hmm. Well, so, thank, you know, thanks, what, Carolyn, what for, for letting us know uh, kind of the background to your story. And Andreas, uh, how did you manage to get into this topic as well? Mm -hmm. Well, to get one thing out of the way, Daryl, I'm certainly not a world-renowned expert on masculinity, so <laughs> okay. uh, I'm able to, uh, you know, I, I, I'm a primarily a biblical scholar who, who loves God's Word and uh, certainly uh, affirm that who we are as men and women is, is, is foundational and is, is an integral part of who we are, and it's simply too important a topic to ignore or, or to neglect. Um, I you know, was converted uh, fairly radically in my early 20s um, and uh, started reading the Bible for the first time um, at that time and uh, came from a, a broken home. Uh, my parents were divorced. And so in many ways, uh, you know, I lacked role models. My father was an absentee father. And so I, you know, certainly... Um, moving toward marriage and having a family, I and as a new Christian, I uh, desperately searched God's word just for for you know what what God's design for for man, man and woman was. Uh, now uh, looking back, uh, my wife and Margaret and I have been married for uh, almost thirty years. We have uh, four children, two girls and and two boys who are 
Uh, mostly grown. I say mostly grown. We still have a 17-year-old who is a senior in high school right now. Um, and uh, so as a as a husband and then as a father, I had to ask myself, you know, uh, how do I love my wife? Uh, how am I a good father, both to my girls and to my boys? I discovered that's uh, a little bit different in both cases, especially um, my boys are younger, how to encourage them to be spiritual leaders in relationships with girls and and how to be responsible, um, how to learn to, to uh to walk in the spirit and so forth. So uh, you mentioned my wife and I wrote a book together, um, God's Design for Man and Woman. We actually met in seminary. And so from early on in our relationship, we started having those uh, theological conversations. Uh, I'm more in in directly in, in biblical studies, especially the New Testament. She's more interested in systematic theology and apologetics and and hermeneutics. Uh, she has a, a, a PhD uh, in the area of systematic theology. So we're partners when it comes to uh, writing and ministry, and we really uh, enjoy that together. Uh, we uh, most recently wrote a book uh, called Equipping for Life, which is um, a book on parenting. And uh, so uh, it's, it's, it's very much part of who we are. Uh, you know, like uh, Carolyn, we we like the, the stories in the Bible, uh, but I think uh, what we do in our book, God's Design for Man and Woman, is, is it's a biblical theological survey. So we basically uh, go from Genesis through Revelation and, and pretty much look at it's God's design in four stages. First of all, as, as Carolyn mentioned, Genesis 1 and 2, the, 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 the pre-fall uh, creation design of God, and then, of course, the second movement in salvation history, the fall, and the way in which God's design was in some ways distorted uh, or corrupted, mm. and then later in Christ, uh, redemption, the very important question, so what happens to our uh, gender identities, our gender roles when we become Christians, what was Christ's purpose in redemption, in terms of restoring the original design uh, for which we're created, and finally consummation, which is still the future. So we found, uh, kind of like the four spiritual laws, when we talk about uh, God's design for man and woman, we have those four movements in Scripture, and we found it's helpful to explain to people God's design based on those four movements. Okay, well that kind of lays the groundwork and actually makes up for a nice transition. So let's, let's talk about the early chapter of Genesis, and here is kind of the question I want to ask, uh, and that is, when we look at the creation, and I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to make some statements, I'll let you all react to them. Um, when we look at the creation, what we see in chapter 1 is the idea that the image of God is reflected both in the creation of the man and in the creation of the woman, that they together male and female are made in the image of God. And so we get that in the in the first chapter and and we we see this element of design that seems to have them both together as stewards. I like to say that one of the words that uh, I didn't come to appreciate until I was 20 years into teaching New Testament was the idea that we are called to steward the creation well together and that actually the point of design is to be able to do that. And you come to chapter 2 and you get a, a kind of almost a zoom in on, on that element because the creation doesn't finish and it certainly doesn't finish well until the woman's created. Uh, that uh, the man is created and the entirety of created beings are paraded before Adam uh, looking for someone who can, uh, who can be a, a complement and a completer of what it is that God has created in Adam. And he goes, no, nope, no, nope, no, nope, no, nope, no, nope, no. Nope. And then Eve is created and he goes, wow. What just happened? Uh, and so, um, so, and, and we get to a very good creation as a result. So when we come to the end of chapter two, and of course the term "help me" is a very much discussed term in relationship to the creation of the woman. That uh, that, and, and it's and it's not a weak term. I think that's an important thing to understand. This is a term that's used to describe how God. Um, uh, 
uh, is involved in the creation. Um, and so we, we see this team, for lack of a better description, that is created at the beginning. And that's phase one. So that's all I'm going to say about the pre-fall. And I will let whoever wants to step into that and fill in whatever you want to fill in with do so. So, uh, and, and and this is, I guess, a, a, may the first person step forward, we'll see who speaks up. Uh, but Carolyn, I see a smile on your face. So, so yeah, what do you, I'm, what do you want to add? <laughs> so I, you know, as I was in this struggle myself, um, I went back to those chapters with a different game plan than I'd ever had before. And I wanted to ask, I, I wanted to look for answers that were universal. I didn't want to leave anyone out anywhere in the world. Um, and I, I wanted to pay a special attention to what God was saying. And I didn't want to make jokes about the man or the woman, which is often what happens when we hear sermons on these texts. Um, so I found th three things that are part of who we are as women. I'm looking. I was looking at first as as a woman, and um, you know the imago day is um, more than uh, a descriptive a description of commonalities between human beings and God. You know, like we see human beings can love and they can have. Um, be compassionate and show mercy and kindness and you know it ends up being a, a list of qualities but i see it as a mission that our first calling as human beings is to know the god who created us and to see the world through his eyes and to learn to love what he loves and to join his mission in the world so for me, when I see the creation call and the mandate that God gives in Genesis 1, it's calling us to everything that has that humanity is, is doing, you know, the exploration of the earth's resources, the stewarding of the earth's resources. And but first and foremost, the call to know the God we are created to be like. Um, I often use the example of Hollywood actors who are image bearers, especially when they're called to portray somebody we all know, like Queen Elizabeth, Helen Mirren did, that that's, that's image bearing and that they study the person that they're to emulate and then they practice being what that person is like. Um, so that was the first thing. The, the second thing that you read in chapter one is that when God commissions his sons and daughters to this global um, mandate, that he blesses them and he sends them out to do the work together. And I've called this the blessed alliance, that, that God created his sons and daughters to do his work and to do it together. And um, in the creation of the woman, I became especially focused on the language for the woman, the Azer Connecto. Um, and I, I think it's important to make the point that God is not fixing something, that there's nothing wrong with the man, that the man is a masterpiece. He's created him at the climax of his creative acti activity, and he's just finished naming the animals, which is the beginning of science. So, you know, there's nothing wrong with the man, but God is teaching us something about human relationships when he says it's not good for the man to be alone. And he doesn't say it's not good for the man to be alone when he wants to start a family or when he wants to be married. It's it's a blanket statement that men and women need each other. And the Azer Connecto language is very powerful. And when I looked it up, they'd already discovered that, um, you know, and the debate was going on about, you know, this is this word is used 21 times in the Old Testament. 16 of those times it's used for God as the helper of his people. And so in the debate about women and men, they um, they were deadlocked on, you know, what do we mean by what do we, we do, she should be a strong helper. But what do we mean by strong? And um, I looked up all those words, and every time you find the word Azer in the Bible, it's used in a military context. Mm 
It's used for God as the shield and defense of his people. And he you know, stands sentry watch over them. He's better than chariots and horses. It's used for three nations, Israel summoned for military aid. Send your armies. And you go back to the Garden of Eden. And if you look closely at it, it's a war zone. There's an enemy getting ready to attack. And God creates the woman to be a warrior with the man in the battles of life. This is what I have concluded. And um, that men need women everywhere in every aspect of life. Um, I would argue in seminary, men need women. You need a female perspective that's missing when you only have men. So somebody like I am, um, I build on the work of men. I couldn't do what I do without the work of men. But I bring a different point of view because I'm a woman and I'm asking different questions. But I can tell any woman that she's an azer, that she's an azer warrior for God's purposes, that her brothers need her, that she needs to be a strength for them, a champion for what God is calling them to do, and she needs to answer God's call herself. Um, so the third actually, third area, and I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you to be a little bit briefer so we so we can get to uh, Andreas. Okay. Um, so what's the third? The blessed alliance, the three things are that are, that you're God's image bearer, that you are called to be an Azer warrior, and that you are, you belong in the blessed alliance. Okay. Um, and and that, that's, a, that's a nice foundation, uh, Andreas. Uh, tell, tell us what, you, what, what else you see in that pre-fall condition. Right. Well, um, I know you want us to talk about Genesis uh, 1 and 2 mm -hmm. right now, but of course, as a as a Christian, uh, I like you. I'm interested in in hermeneutics and in, in, in biblical theology. So I want to properly uh, read the Bible the way uh, you know we ought to, and to also give it the authority that it deserves to have in our lives. And so, in this case, we happen to have uh, New Testament authors that that uh, shed some light on how, as Christians, we ought to read Genesis one and two. And I think primarily of of Paul here, who. Uh, said that there's a reason, uh, you know, why uh, Genesis 1 and 2 talk about us being created male and female. He alludes to that in Galatians uh, 3.28, possibly. Uh, but then also he talks about the fact that uh, the man was created first and then the woman, and he uh, he draws from that in, in 1 Timothy 2.12, also in 1 Corinthians 11. Eight and nine, uh, certain implications with regard to the, the the male and female identity individually in relation to each other, the roles they have, um, and perhaps another important uh, factor there is that he refers to Christ as the second Adam, and so uh, you know we see that uh, there's a connection there with 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 Adam being the uh, the head of the human race, the, the the representative, ultimately, and so you see this biblical theological connection that that Paul establishes between Adam uh, being the uh, the first head, and then Christ being uh, the one who dies for the sins of of, of all male and female. So, uh, in our book, God's Design for Man and Woman, Margaret and I uh, discuss the fact that you have kind of a dual track. You have, on the one hand, some teaching on male-female partnership, and we see that clearly in Genesis 1. They're jointly uh, called to, to multiply, to, to, to fill the earth, to subdue it, um, and uh, for God as His representatives being created in His image, which I take to mean primarily that they represent Him and exercise representative stewardship and role. And then secondly, I see this, uh, and we see this pattern of, of male leadership that's, that's also pervasive. So, uh, you know, the way we, we read the Bible, you see it going from Adam to the, 
the patriarchs then uh, delivers national delivers like Moses or Joshua. You see the, the the Levitical priesthood. You see the kings. You see Jesus being incarnated as male. You see the twelve uh, being men. You see the elders uh, being required to be faithful husbands, implying they're men. And then even the twenty four elders in Revelation are uh, representing uh, the Old and New Testament uh, leadership. So uh, I think. The problem that we often get into is if we uh, focus too much on one side of that track and maybe not enough on the other. And I think uh, we see in Genesis 1 and 2 that Scripture teaches both. Genesis 1 focuses more on the equality, and then chapter 2 focuses more like a zoom lens on the role differentiation between the man and the woman. Okay, so let, so let, me, let me pick up where you've raised, and I want to raise a passage that's bothered me, uh, and it's Ephesians 5. Um, because there, I think you see the role distinction. It's pretty. La- it's laid out in one level very, very clearly, um, and the passage, of course, is wonderfully controversial in our time because it uses a word that that many people uh, struggle with in our time. It's the, it uses the word submission, um, and then alongside that, we get the um, passage on love. And here, here's the question that I have. It, and and I'll lay out what I'm thinking, and again, I'll get the reaction, and I'll start with you, Andreas. Um, yeah. and it has to do with, are we defining the way in which men and women are to relate to one another in the way in which the Bible does or in the way in which the culture does? Uh-huh. Okay? That's the question I want to raise as I raise this passage. So let me, let me lay out what I, what I struggle with. So I look at Ephesians 5, and, and I, I think it's clear that there is a distinction between what the, how the woman is asked to respond in the marriage versus the responsibility of the man in the marriage. One is told to submit, the other is told to love. I, I think it, at least in terms of the terminology, we're agreed about what the, what's going on in the text. But then I have an exercise that I have my students do. The exercise I have my students do is I have them pull out a, a, a yellow sheet or a white sheet and draw a line down the middle. On one side I have them put rank, and on the other side I have them put service. And I ask them to read through the section where the man is called to love the wife. And I say, everywhere you see something that relates to rank, put a check on one side, and everywhere where you see the, something related to service, put it on the other. And I give them time to go through this exercise, to you know walk through the passage. And what inevitably happens is that, uh, and, and you all know this, um, what inevitably happens is is that the service side is literally cluttered with checks and phrases, and the rank side basically has the one, you know, the term head. That's basically, if if anything shows up on that side, that's the the check that shows up. And the question that I ask is this, and this is the question I'm going to ask you. And that is, in the midst of talking about how we tend to talk about leadership and direction and all those kinds of things, rank and hierarchy and all those terms, how is the hierarchy and the exercise of the hierarchy, how is it supposed to function according to the way Scripture lays it out? Because the example is the way Christ gave himself for the church, mm-hmm. that he nurtures mm-hmm. the body, that he's a part, that he's one flesh part of, etc. So how do we balance – you talked about two tracks, Andreas. How do we balance Mm – and this gets into our question of biblical masculinity, it seems to me, pretty directly. How do we balance the role that at least many in evangelicalism see the man as having with the detail of the way in which that is described when it's actually laid out for us? Yeah. Uh, First of all, I certainly resonate with your caution and you know, my own understanding that we tend to, especially in an area like this, uh, read our experience uh, into Scripture or, you know, our culture, obviously, as you mentioned, is a very controversial issue. Uh, and so it's, it's easy to do to, to profess uh, belief in biblical authority, but in, in fact, maybe even without intending to, uh, we, we tend to read our preferences and our culture uh, into uh, those controversial passages. So as, as much as possible, I think uh, it is important for us to, to recognize that and, and to, to consciously counteract that. And uh, so in this case, I think one thing that's important to remember is that this is part of what, what is often called a house table or household code. Uh, and, and so the, the, the 
the context, the places, the male-female relationship or the marriage relationship in the context also of other relationships such as uh, children and parents or even, uh, you know, servants and, and, and masters in the ancient extended household because they were still part of a household. And so you see that that same pattern that first addresses the, the, the people who are called to submit to authority uh, and then uh, you know, the, the the people in authority. So I think part of why there's not as much emphasis on the exercise of authority is because that's implicit in the household code and is largely presupposed and assumed. Uh, and I think then what, what Paul is trying to do is he's trying to show that, uh, that Christianity uh, in, in many ways, flavors and, and, and shapes those types of submission authority relationships in a Christ-like manner. And that's where you talked about the fact that, that we see in Christ uh, the perfect example of someone who genuinely was the head, and so that's undisputed. Paul didn't feel a need to argue for that. He's the head of a church, and, and, and he uh, looking at Ephesians, one thing that transformed me is to read Ephesians 5 in the context of the entire letter, because there's a lot already. You mentioned the word head. Well, that's first mentioned in chapter 1, so I certainly would challenge and encourage our readers to, to not start in chapter 5, to start in chapter 1 and read, uh, you know, chapter 5 in, in, in light of that. So, uh, and there, your students are right. The passage uh, implores uh, men to to use their their God given privilege uh, as leaders in the marriage relationship to serve their wives, to nurture them. I certainly, for myself, I I, I try to reciprocate uh, my wife supporting me through seminary uh, by uh, supporting her and watching the children and then being a research assistant so she could get her PhD uh, and, you know, uh, explore and, and, and reach her full intellectual and spiritual potential. So I think there's plenty of us, for us men, to learn that masculinity uh, in many ways means servanthood. Hmm. Carolyn? Yeah, I mean, I think... Um, it's that's really important, you know. And I love what you've done for for your wife. Um, one of the things that um, I has become really important to me is to look at the cultural context of the time of Paul and the culture that he's writing to. Like you speak of the household codes and um, the power of the man over his wife, his children, and his slaves. Um, but um, in the first century, you would have had a very, um, I mean, I, th I think this points out that what is what Paul is doing here is so radical. Um, and, you know, I always think, just imagine giving this message to the Taliban and telling them to sacrifice themselves for their wives, you know, because the background is the, is a patriarchal culture where you had child marriage. There was a, there was a push to, to produce sons. And so as soon as a, a girl reached uh, puberty, she was marriageable. And here they're telling the husband to, to lay down his life for, for her. And there's a there's an education differential. There's a power differential, and Paul is is calling them to each other, in a, an, in a radical a way that would have been radical in in that culture, way more radical than it would be in in our culture. Um, I think, you know, the call in marriage is like Philippians two where we are called to put the interests of one another ahead of each other, you know, that that we're not called to be, you know, I'm going to fight for my rights and whatever, but that we're called to each other in a, in a beautiful way. Um, and, I th and I think the gospel does that. Um, one of my uh, a, a colleague, uh, Roy Champa, as New Testament professor, talked about identity mapping, that when we read these texts, we think husband and we think of our husband and we think wife and we think of ourselves. But he said, you know, these were these were child marriages. This wasn't somebody marrying his college sweetheart or his wife who gets a Ph.D. <laughs> you know, this was uh, girls weren't educated. It's like the Middle East today. 
So to take the gospel into that culture was a radical thing. Um, but I also like to think about the bride of Christ um, in this discussion, because that brings men into the conversation as part of the bride. And when you read in Revelation, you know, come and see the bride. And she is she is celebrated for her the dress she's wearing. It's woven of her deeds of justice. She's been in the battle with him. She's embraced Jesus' mission. You know, she's the azer next to Jesus. And um, I think, you know, we're we're called to lay down our lives for each other. We're called to care about that other person in ways that nobody else cares and to love them in deeper and more sacrificial ways. I, I think that's important in any generation. So what I, what I think I'm hearing, uh, I th- maybe both of you say, uh, is in the midst of the distinctions that exist in Scripture, there is this commitment to um, to to mutuality, if I can say it that way, even in the midst of those distinctions. And in the midst of that mutuality, there is a um, uh, a consideration I'm, – I'm trying to find a word um, – a consideration given to the other in the midst of that that communicates care and concern and love. Uh, and that the other thing that I do think I'm hearing from both of you as well is, is that there is a, 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 a kind of reconfiguring of what the culture does with the category versus what Scripture's trying to do with the category. And in the midst of that, there is, there is uh, even though the household cult fits very naturally in first century culture, there is something countercultural going on simultaneously in the way the roles are being presented uh, to people in the church as to how they should live out the calling of God. Andreas, is that, I'll start with you, is that fair? Yeah, I think there are some real differences here, uh-huh. uh, and uh, as a result, I think uh, the application uh, will be different uh, also. I think it's important to have clarity as to you know what God's design in the first place was. I do interpret uh, you know uh, Genesis 1 and 2, as I mentioned, through the lenses of, of Paul's words in the New Testament, and so I, I do see that, uh, that, that term of, that's translated as, as helper. As, as, as the woman being a partner, but still under uh, the man's uh, overall leadership. Uh, and, but but I, I do agree that, uh, you know, even though the man was created as a leader, which I tend to think refers to him also as the provider, as the protector, that uh, the fall distorted that, and the culture sometimes picks up on the distorted image of masculinity as 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 aggressive or as 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 robbing the woman of her, of her dignity and of transgressing those boundaries and so they are uh, Christ and redemption in him uh, challenges the sinful uh, distortion of, of of God's original design and so uh, we need to be careful to distinguish between what's cultural or even what's traditional on the one hand and what's truly biblical and so I think that's probably something that we can all agree on that that uh, Christ uh, dignifies uh, really the role of both the man and the woman and and and, and so again as Christians we have this incredible privilege and opportunity uh, remember in Ephesians 5 before it ever gets to marriage he talks about be filled with the Holy Spirit there's a spirit filled followers of Christ we can relate to each other the way uh, God originally intended it uh, and that's a beautiful thing I you know, give you one example. The other night, uh, there was a you know a dog. Uh, our neighbor's dog uh, invaded our territory and attacked our dog. And so we wake up and then you know I get on my slippers and I I first of all protect our dog, and then secondly I I I walk over to the neighbor's house and then you know I I talk to him and I, I say you know excuse me could you try to restrain your dog and respect our boundaries? And so uh, it's the kind of thing my wife did not resent me doing that at all. And then she, you know, was not the one who felt like she wanted to do that. So there was this instinctual reaction on my part to protect uh, my family and to draw certain boundaries. And I think it's a beautiful example of how leadership can actually be service and can be a, a God-honoring and Christ-like thing to do. Okay, Carolyn, your your take on on kind of where we are right now? Yeah, I, you know, 
we're talking about marriage and the bigger issue of masculinity is universal. So little boys and elderly men and men who never marry. So it's, you know, there, there are bigger questions to deal with here. But I, you know, I, when I look at what it is to be the Amago day, I see that implicit in that is a call to leadership. That, you know, that some of the language that women hear in the church is a call to hold back. It's a call to be less. I expected when I got married that I would that I would pull back and that we would do his story, that he was the husband and he was the head and he was the leader and that I was going to help get him through school. But then I was going to take care of the home front and he would take care of everything else. And he said to me when we got married, he said, you need to find out what your gifts are and what God is calling you to do with your life. And I'm not the answer to that question. And I didn't expect to hear that. But what my husband has done, and you can call this headship um, if you want, but what he has done for me is swing open doors, is challenge me to my stewardship before God, is to um, push me through those doors that open. I wouldn't be doing anything I'm doing. If it hadn't been for him, I thought, you know, I'm I'm done. You know, when I got married to him, I thought we're doing this is the story we're doing. And he would have none of it. He grew up in the same kind of broken home that you talked about, Andreas, and watched his mother, you know, go through a divorce to save their lives because there was a lot of violence and never get a break, never have anybody advocate for her, never have anybody look and see what are the gifts that are here. And um, I got all of that from him. And it has been utterly life-changing for both of us. And I do the same for him. I want him to flourish. I want to know when he walks in the door, is he okay? What has his day been like? I want to be his best friend, his strongest advocate. Um, And if he heads down a wrong path, I want to be the first roadblock. (laughs) You know, I, I want to bring everything to this relationship. And women hear that they are to bring less, that they are, and we often hear we're to let the man lead, which is sort of you know, not the same thing uh, as him really being the leader. Um, so I, you know, and this is just the marriage arena. We're, you know, well, I think let me let me let me break in here because we're running short on time, and I want to do some summary work. Um, let me tell you what I'm hearing. What I'm hearing is is that uh, and and I'm hearing two levels of the conversation. One is the generic kind of male and female discussion that is operates inside and outside of marriage. The other thing that I'm hearing are internal marriage dynamics in both of what you're saying, and and what I'm hearing is is that the couple in their relationship are called to work out between themselves. Um, how their internal dynamic is going to work. Um, and uh, I hear Andreas describing a marriage in which he takes a certain role, his wife is comfortable with that role, they, uh, they march accordingly, if I can say it that way. And I hear in your marriage, Carolyn, uh, uh, at one level a similar dynamic where you all have worked it out between each other, and you have marched forward, and, and, and in both cases, you're getting a mutually supported uh, team functioning that is, uh, that is designed uh, in both cases, even though the details are different, in both cases to try and make sure that both participants are able to be all they can be before God. Um, and yeah. 
Uh, if I can maybe just interject, yeah. I think Carol mentioned earlier that, you know, we live in a broken world, and so we do talk about God's creation ideal and, and design, but but there's, of course, many who might be listening who, who do struggle, maybe single parents or, or or you know, couples struggling with infertility or, or, or even uh, temporarily, uh, you know, where, where one of the, the, the two uh, goes to grad school or college or seminary and the other supports them during that time. And so I, I think I, I, I want to be clear that that uh, things in this world, uh, in many ways, we, we, we struggle with, with making things work uh, as best as we can uh, in light of uh, what scripture teaches, and that may not always be uh, perfect or even even doable in a, in a given situation. So, in many ways, this is more something that's kind of aspirational or something that we uh, we strive and, and toward the, rather than. We and have the additional arrived. level on top of that is is that as Christians, of course, what we're striving towards is the the example of a redemptive relationship, in which Christ has come into the space of dealing with sin and fallenness and coming short. Mm-hmm and challenging us uh, to be all we have been created to be. And, and so in the midst of certainly what is not a perfect world, and, and, and we do all struggle, there is this aspiration that is set for us that is the target that we're aiming after and what we're trying to draw ever and ever closer to. Well, believe it or not, our time is gone. Um, and uh, we, we actually uh, – I feel like we just barely got started. Uh, but I do want to thank you all for coming in and, and, and sharing your take on this topic. I, I think it's interesting to have seen kind of the give and take on the one hand, and yet on the other, this recognition that what Christ is doing among believers is, is ultimately designed to make sure that men and women are able to flourish before him in ways in which uh, we are able to live out the way God has designed us and called us in terms of who we're supposed to be. So let me thank you all again for, for helping us with this discussion. Uh, I, I, if if you're on the other side listening to this, I know we just got started in terms of talking about it, so give us some grace, uh, because it's, it, is a, it is a complicated topic, and it's become more complicated, uh, I think, and, uh, and, yet, and yet I think the aspiration and the goal is so important uh, that, uh, that it's uh, an important discussion to be engaged in and to be reflecting about, and I, hopefully that's what we've been able to do for the listener today. So thank you, Carolyn. Thank you, Andreas, for, for helping us yeah. with this. Thank you, Daryl, for moderating this very important discussion. I know you've had a burden uh, for this for many years. Yeah. And uh, I want to thank you for uh, joining us on The Table. We hope you'll join us again soon. Thanks for listening to The Table Podcast. For more podcasts like this one, visit dts.edu slash the table. Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth, love well.